Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 151. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. We've got full crew in tonight. <laughs> and I know why it is. I know why full crew are here tonight. It's because you want to get your gaming knowledge up, don't you? Because quiz is coming up in two weeks. The quiz is coming up in two weeks. Need to keep my mind engaged, fresh, thinking about games 24-7. <laughs> I thought he was here for the free beer. <laughs> now, we will, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Now, you can get some free beer. Uh, but I'm asking that I can't keep up with you guys. If one of you's not in America, the other one is. Well, I've just come back from a couple of weeks in America, and now I believe Ravi is jetting off tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. you got the sunny weather, though, so I think I'm yeah. going to hit the rain. And the, <laughs> the reason he's going, the only reason Ravi's going to America is to go to this vintage computer festival that's over there to learn about video games ready for the quiz. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to brush <laughs> up on all these strange <laughs> systems like uh, Coco and Tandy and all of the questions where we failed last time. Yeah, absolutely. We always get panned on like the stuff about the weird... The, the older s- stuff, Yeah, the old man, stuff. like Paul. Paul! <laughs> It's already starts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you haven't heard the quiz, what this will be our third one now. Yeah. Every year on the podcast, we do a Christmas super quiz, and uh, I don't know, rub it in, guys, but you have lost two years in a row. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I think it's it's kind of rude to beat the guests, though, isn't it? You know, yeah, you got to like, let them win. Uh, like the first year, we were panning them, and we were like. You know, we should really like hold back a little bit, but then we held back a bit too much, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fine balance, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it is coming up. This is actually um, our last normal show, as normal as this podcast can be, of 2018, because next week we're going to have a little look back on the best bits of 2018. And then, yeah, while you're away, Ravi, and uh, while Joe's at home, on the internet watching videos, reading books. Reading old <laughs> what, articles. what kind of videos in books? <laughs> Video game ones, obviously, to research. Uh, not the stuff you normally look at. <laughs> but then I'm going to be doing the questions for this quiz. Um, I'm going to make it a brutal one this year. Let's put it out there. Oh, great. Um, so we're going to have a week off, aren't we? Yeah, then, then we're going to have a week off because yeah. you'll need it after uh, after your victory. I'm sure. And then yeah, winning the super quiz. we'll be going into 2019 <laughs> with some amazing guests. We've got some absolutely awesome people lined up. Yep. It's, it's, it's quite shocked me because January is usually a hard month to get people on the show, but we've got some stunners. And actually, we've got a great guest today as well. Now, this all kind of came about because a Play Expo in Blackpool. I wasn't there on the Saturday because I was at a friend's wedding. You were away on holiday, mm-hmm. Joe. You were there, Ravi, but you, you told me how good this panel that Paul Drury did. I know you don't want to big Paul Drury up too much because he's going to try and trance him in the quiz in a couple of weeks. But you did a panel with the uh, the guys from Task Set. Yeah, I'd, I'd not really heard of Task Set before because I wasn't that much of a C64 yeah. guy. But listening to the talk and kind of seeing about their weird, quirky, very British games, I thought, oh, this sounds excellent. And Paul, he, he holds the microphone f- too far away from him, so we couldn't use his recording. <laughs> so we had to get them on. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, it's they were a quintessentially British company, I mean, based in Bridlington. They kind of had that kind of, you know, mid-80s seaside postcard kind of humour in a lot of their games. And they were a company that just, they really prided themselves on making these really unique games. You know, while a lot of people back then were churning out, like, another Space Invaders or another Pac-Man clone, they were working really hard and doing stuff that nobody had ever seen before. And it was kind of Monty Python-esque, wasn't it? Like a lot of those old specky games and C64 games. Well, they really, you know, they were the kings of the Commodore 64, really. A lot of their games really pushed the boundaries and, you know, even stuff they had. I mean, we'll talk more about it in the the interview that we're going to do with Andy Walker, who was the former managing director of Test Set. You know, there's games in there, for example, Jammin, that was kind of a a reggae-influenced game where it had this like pulsating beat going through it and the, the aim was to go around collecting musical notes and stuff like that and <laughs> that game inspired Rob Hubbard to yeah. start making Commodore 64 That's music. Amazing. You know, it's stuff like that that I don't think they get enough recognition and love so it is really good that we're going to be able to bring you a special all about Test Set on the Retro Hour podcast with Andy Walker, the former managing director, coming up in around 15 minutes from now. And of course, now we're into December. The party season's on. I'm going to say two words, Joe, that will make your eyes light up. Oh. Free beer. How does that sound? Sounds brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this is our sponsor. Now, we do have a sponsor on this week's episode of the podcast, and I think it's one you're going to like. Now, we want to sort you out with a free case of craft beer just for being a listener to the Retro Hour podcast. You can think of this as our little present to you. Now, this is thanks to our very good friends at beer52.com. Now, all you've got to do, if you'd like to get hold of a free case of craft beer, we're serious, it's completely free, all you've got to do is head to beer52, that is beer52.com. 
facebook.com slash retro to claim a free case of craft beer. Now, this is your perfect chance to get some special beers in time for Christmas because B52, they're the world's most popular monthly craft beer discovery club. And what they do is they search out incredible exclusive small batch craft beers from the world's greatest breweries and bring them direct to their members. And I was kind of looking at it and they had two options, kind of light or dark beer. Yeah. I'm not really into my dark beer. I like IPAs and light stuff. So you can kind of get a crate to your choice and you also get free snacks as well, yeah. which is a bonus. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that. <laughs> That's the thing as well. I mean, I, I've always fancied joining something like this. It's very good that it's come along at this time, actually. Because, I mean, you know, you got the supermarket. If you want something a little bit different, though, especially this time of year when, you know, you've got those... You spend a lot of time indoors, aren't you? Those oh, nice, absolutely. Because, you know, it's with a fire on, you know, with Drinking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but playing your favourite computer games and, you absolutely. know... Absolutely. And a little drinky. Uh, studying. Whatever, <laughs> yeah, studying for the quiz. Uh, well, I mean, the thing about Beer 52 as well is every month they focus on a new country or theme. Like, at the moment, they're doing West Country Road Trip Month. So what they do is it essentially features amazing beers from around Bristol. And I lived in Bristol for a few years, you know. It's a very good area for beer. Um, brands like, you know... Firebrand's new England IPA, uh, Keller Pilsner, like you said, Dark Ales, lighter beers as well. Not the kind of stuff you find in the supermarket. And you also get a 100-page ferment magazine in the box as well if you want to learn more about beer. So you can claim your free case of beer. All you've got to do is pay the £5.95 postage, which I think is a bargain, and you will get eight craft beers sent to your house with the ferment magazine and snacks included with next-day shipping as well. So God, this is a no-brainer, really, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Eight beers as well yeah quite a good selection there exactly say, you can't even get free for a fiver anymore no exactly market, so. <laughs> so all you gotta do if you'd like to claim this offer do it right now head to beer52.com beer52.com forward slash retro you'll be helping out the podcast there is no minimum commitment you can just take the free case if you want try the beers see what you think if it's not for you you can pause to cancel at any time so don't miss out to get your chance to get these beers in for the festive season all you've got to do is head to beer52.com forward slash retro now, in a minute, we're going to talk about some really interesting stories. We've been uh, chatting about AVGN, Angry yeah. Video Game, his CD32 video. Yeah, me and Ravi were having a bit of a debate about that earlier on. It was, you know, Ravi was like, he's giving, giving the wrong facts. And I was just <laughs> like, well, I don't know. Like, I enjoyed the video. And then Dan was defending both sides. So, yeah, no, it was a Straight down the middle, interesting actually. video. Though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Ravi is, I mean, some of you might not know this, he's actually probably the biggest CD32 collector I've ever met. Yeah, and uh, the system's rubbish, I will <laughs> fully admit that. <laughs> he admits that, he agreed it was rubbish. But... On Upon, release, upon it is, release, it is good now that the fans have kind of taken over and <laughs> added in stuff, but upon Commodore's release, my God, I didn't even notice it getting released. I didn't see any adverts and anything. I remember reading about it in the magazines and stuff, but it was only on the market for like six months, wasn't it? Yeah. But I did a couple of videos about the CD32, and recently they've been getting loads more views, and all the comments are like, AVGN sent me here. It's weird how a YouTuber can do that. They can kind of really yeah. put the spotlight on something that a lot of the world probably didn't know about. I mean, I find it interesting because I'd never heard of it until I met you guys. Yeah. Like, you know, I've known Dan now for, what, eight years or yeah, so? Yeah. And that's when I first learned about it, when you told me about it then. But I I was a gamer. I was through and through a gamer as, you know, a child and stuff. And watched Games Master, all the magazines, and I never saw anything about it. I, had, I didn't have a clue. So, but yeah, I th there's a lot of videos out there. Dan's video is really good on it. Um, and now it's it's cool to see, you know, AVGN, one of the bigger ones. Well, you know, no, just, no disregard to Dan there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite in the same level as AVGN. That's but, you know, some of the bigger ones acknowledging it and stuff, you yeah. know, and going into detail about it. But like I say, you know, like Ravi says, it was crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the thing was, I was a huge Amiga fan and yeah. I knew nothing about it. The only yeah. time I found about it was when I was in the car boot set where a guy was selling dodgy Amiga discs and he's like, oh, you heard Amiga's a... Got a CD console out and everyone burst out laughing because <laughs> right. the whole of Amiga was done by then. Yeah. It was massively done. It, we didn't even know that Commodore was still existing as an entity. Like there was but no, they, they probably weren't. There. Yeah, there was yeah. no warranties, yeah. phone lines, customer support, nothing like that. So bringing out a console then was like, huh? what? Weird. Well, move. That's the thing. It was at their death knell, really, wasn't it? it was yeah. trying, you know, trying to get some money La to last breath of life. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yeah. And I actually got two CD32s um, probably about a year after Commodore went under. 
and I got them for £25 nice. from a local computer shop. The reason I bought them mainly, though, was the CD players, yeah. audio CD players for my room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I played games and stuff on them, too. Um, I used to love games like Gloom and that and Bubber and Sticks that he talks about in the video. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, now they go for, like, what, about 400 quid? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen box ones going for nearly eight. It's yeah. crazy. So, well, we are going to talk about a new little um, anthology collection because there is a bit of a, an unofficial... CD32 scene that's thriving at the moment. Uh, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. And also, Joe, a little, uh, little one for you. 11 Sega products you've probably never heard of. Oh, More on that coming up in just a sec. Now, before we do that, we've got to give a big shout to the people who have made the Retro Hour podcast almost make its third year now. The people who allow us to come in here each week and do the show for you, bring you quality guests, do the Christmas quiz, keep churning out the show week in, week out. And that is people who found it in their hearts to make a little donation into the running of the Retro Hour podcast. And if you do that, any amount, just a couple of quid, I mean, it might be the cost of a cup of coffee once a month, you will find your place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And, of course, anything we get into the running of the show 100% goes back on the show as well. Uh, Ravi's not spending it in America on his, uh, you know, peanuts on the flight or anything like that. <laughs> That's because I've already spent it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, what joke, do you think Joe's Disney World trip came from? <laughs> yeah, we, we do jest. So this week we want to give a big shout to Michael Fisher. Martin Henney. Lawrence Benyon. And Simon Buckner, who all made donations into the running of the show. And you can do the same. We've got a little PayPal link or cryptocurrency. If you've got any of that floating around that you want to get rid of, like uh, I think a lot of people do at the moment, you can find all that on the front page of our website at theretrohour.com. Now, let's get into a few news stories before we bring you our interview with Andy Walker from Tasset. Have you heard of a game called Desert Bus? Yes. Um, so from what I understand, is Desert Bus an unreleased Sega game from the early 90s, part of a Penn & Teller compilation for Sega CD. Yeah. Uh, And from what I understand, isn't it like, you literally, you drive a bus, all you do is you just have to press, is it left and right to stay on the road because it leers slightly to like the left and it's like a 24-hour road trip like across like the Nevada desert or something. In real time. In real time. And people play it for charity from what I understand yeah. <laughs> and it's got a huge 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 community backing that is I think I think I'm pretty I'm you've pretty, nailed it there I've nailed much. it there yeah. uh, that's without reading it as well and uh, yeah I, I heard about this like you know a couple of years ago like you know the first time they did it but I didn't realise they'd done it every year since which is amazing <laughs> well they do this yeah I mean a charity gaming marathon um, where they play this game and this is the 12th year that they've done this now 12th year yeah, and they've raised seven hundred and thirty thousand dollars for charity. That's amazing by playing the game. That's um, just this year. That's not overall. That's just this year. They've, yeah, they've done that. Well, I mean, you mentioned then twenty four hours in real time. It's not. It's actually as long as you want to play it. Yeah. So they played a hundred and sixty hours wow. of the game. <laughs> wow, man! How many of them did they do in it? Were they taking it in turns, or does it not say? It doesn't mention that in here. I mean, I imagine there must have been a few of them doing yeah, it, surely. Sure. Yeah, sure. One guy sat there for 160 <laughs> hours. That's the thing. It, it's not a game. It's more of a, a mental challenge. Yeah. Oh, man. I just... For charity, though. You know, good cause. Yeah, and all that. absolutely. The thing about it is, I mean, this game, if you haven't seen it before, literally, you're in like a, a bus. You look yep. out the window. You've got a little steering wheel. And you've got a road that just scrolls. Yeah, and nev- that, it never changes. Never changes, and you just leer slightly off to the left and right, and yeah. you just have to stay on the road. Yeah. The challenge are, is staying awake. Are any of the <laughs> functions of the Sega CD used? Are they like a, a cool soundtrack or anything? Or it no, just looks like a simple bus game. It goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally, it makes that noise. It's sixteen-bit audio. <laughs> <laughs> so even the sound of it will kind of make you nod off after a while, yeah. isn't it? It's very much a challenge. Um, probably hardly. I, I don't think I could sit and play that for ten minutes. <laughs> No, no, I wouldn't. Hours, yeah. Why would you? That's the thing. But I guess that's kind of like the the community of it and everything. But it says here five point two million they've raised over the twelve wow, years. That's amazing. So that is amazing. So obviously it's uh, built up a bigger bigger reputation over the years. And I guess I think like stuff like Twitch and you know that kind of stuff really helps as well. Yeah. You know how they've got to do it next. They've actually got to drive. From like Las Vegas to Tucson, you probably a, find that's easier with, yeah. <laughs> with a copy of the game in it. Whilst <laughs> doing it alongside, whilst doing it, 
Yeah, so I mean, that is an endurance test. So, yeah, mad respect to them. That's awesome. Don't get any ideas for our next live stream, Ravi. Right. <laughs> I do like to think of yourself as a bit of a Sega fan. I do, I do. A little, little article here um, on Digitizer 2000 from a yes. good friend, Mr. Biffo. 11 Sega products you've likely never heard of. I thought I was going to be really arrogant and like, I was looking through it five minutes ago and I was going to be know it, know it, know it, seen it, got one. I've seen one of these. <laughs> no, two. Which one have you seen then? So I've seen Pods, which is the top one. What's that is, then? What are Pods? Uh, I think it's just like a... Um, uh, like a standalone gaming thing. Yeah, it's like a Simon Says kind of thing, yeah. but it like it has like a, you know sensors, so you don't like... I don't think you press anything. It like the lights up. It's like free lights, like white lights, and then you kind of raise your hands over them as they light up, and you have to like chase them. I think. Let's hover over the top. Like of them. hover over the top mm. of them. That's what I understand. I know that's been. I've seen a few videos on that. Uh, and then the uh, the le- the electronic robot dog. You know, everybody's seen the little robot dogs and that Pacific one. I never knew that was Sega. I was going to say that. I, I, I remember that those. Sega. I yeah. remember them. I think my sister had one. Uh, over 10 million sold so you know every little girl had one at one point but that's literally it like everything else like this is a weird one the Sega Grand Pianist yeah, which is a, a piano that was released in 2007 a tiny piano with a hundred built in songs that reads from memory card that is so weird <laughs> What about the fireworks projector? Fireworks projector. I thought that was a magnifying glass at first glance. <laughs> it does look very scientific, actually, it doesn't does, it? It does, doesn't it? I just, and Sega are just a, such an oddball company. That's really cool, though, a, a, a Sega digital camera. Yeah. And they've got a home planetarium as well that would project kind of Star Wars-themed models and stuff on your, on your roof and things. I mean... I do love the comment he's put here. It looks like it could be something out of a urologist's office. Absolutely. <laughs> Sega Vision as well. A TV and radio tuner from 2008. I just feel like Sega were just this kind of company that just like, they always think like, this is going to be the next big thing, guys. Like, let's get our fingers in this pie. Let's like see if this takes off. And, you know, they kind of struck gold with, the, you know, with gaming, you know, for, you know, from the, you know. One the generation. And, for one generation, the, <laughs> and 80s the arcades, and 90s. The arcades. Yeah. The arcades. And now just just like, looking at all these items from like 2000, 2004, 2007, they've just been trying to find that market again and just be like, yeah, we're going to be the next big digital camera light producer or the next big toy producer and it's just not working out. I, I love the fact that digital camera as well, you could um, you could print it out of their own booths <laughs> at arcade machines and it was um, going to be compatible with the Sega Saturn as well. So oh, that, that would have been a big know. market, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, I can imagine all of uh, all the Sega Sega printing booths in Wilco's and Boots. Yeah, I can see them now. <laughs> <laughs> Suggest it next time you're in Asda, yeah. West Bridgeford in the Superstore, yeah. <laughs> have you got one? I've got this camera here. How do I get stuff off it? So if you're doing to check out the full list, it is very interesting. I mean, yeah, that, the one thing on that that really stood out to me though is that Poochy little dog. Yeah, now that was it. Was released in two thousand. A little dog with kind of floppy blue ears. Yeah, I remember different seeing them colors as well, like pink and orange and stuff like that. Similar to the uh, the Apple computers at the time. <laughs> yeah, actually, did they like, like yeah. an iMac? A yeah. like that. they were on a lot of like the tech shows and stuff on TV. Yeah. I remember seeing Poochy dogs. Yeah, I didn't know Sega made them. No, I don't remember seeing Sega been, branding. I'm just already, reading it but... here, and it says it's pretty much one of Sega's biggest non-gaming successes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It sold ten million units, and they weren't cheap. Yeah. yeah, I remember the movement cheap, so go Sega. It's some poochy news next week then. It's a big market, it seems. So we're going to check out the full list. It's on Digitizer 2000, and we'll put that in our show notes, along with all of the rest of this week's stories at theretrohour.com. Now, we did mention the CD32 at the start of the show, Ravi. Now, there is a big homebrew scene. Yeah, so there's a massive homebrew scene because basically all of the stuff was shovelware that was shoved onto CD32. So they'd get kind of discs... And they'd do nothing from the disc version, even to the point that they wouldn't reassign the up from jump on the controller to an extra button. And uh, it meant that a lot of the releases were really bad. But what people have been doing over time, and this is what I mean, the fans are bringing fantastic stuff to the CD32, is they've been making compilations and they've been adding stuff like FMV, full motion video from other systems, and having that at the beginning. They've been making great little demos, but also they've been doing add-ons because the CD32 was quite an underpowered machine. So Stephen Leary's been doing his terrible fire add-ons, which really help stuff. Now, this is a Amiga CD32 anthology, and this requires uh, the fast RAM okay. to actually be running f- uh, f- from one of the modified boards. So this is 
made for a modified CD32. So what essentially this is, I mean, it's a guy called Amiga J who does a lot of these compilations. He will get a lot of the best games and he'll put them onto one CD that you can then burn because, I mean, you've got to remember then, CD32, Mega CD, all those systems didn't have copy protection on them. Yeah. You know, you try and get a CD burner in, like, what, 1993? It was, like, what, 50 grand or something? Yeah. Like, <laughs> no one had them at home then. <laughs> so they've started releasing these little homebrew compilations and they do the artwork for them. You can print them out. You can put them in a box and actually look like, you know, when, when you've got them all It's made. how they should have been done, really. Yeah. That's, like, they're doing the job uh, that Commodore should have done. Yeah. Well, one that I love here is um, it's a point-and-click adventure game collection. Um, you know, with some of the best games on there, Monkey Island, Sam and the Sorcerer, Indiana Jones, and they've also got a demo collection as well. And yeah. I've even seen they've been doing like converting cartoons and stuff like anime stuff that you can you can watch on the CD32. And uh, this time of year, it's quite good. There's a Christmas compilation with Christmas games and demos. And yeah, there's also these mega compilations with just so much stuff on it. But I think this is particularly great that they're making these fast gram compilations because. People with these boards, which are actually open source, yeah. which is really good, are going to start getting more, much more powerful games than the CD32. I, I reckon we're going to see, because he's releasing an O30 card soon, I reckon we're probably going to see Doom on the CD32. I think it's already out. So, and there's an Akiko yeah. version of it, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, it's nuts. I mean, the fact we, we talked about in the start of the show that, you know, it, it was such a flop at the time, but now all these years later, people are like, kind of taking it under their wing and embracing it's, it. It's just, I don't know, it's just weird. It's got such a, like, a... A weird fascination around it like i like i said never heard of it until i was older and you know no desire to play it but damn do i want one yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that thing that you just mentioned the akiko chip that's one prime thing with the cd32 they put that chip in there to make make stuff run faster but yeah. no one actually used it was it one game one game, one game used out it, the yeah. whole system <laughs> nice. used it so um now that they're making games that use it and kind of actually use the resources of the console, it's making it a much better system, isn't it? Yeah, you know, to wait 25 years. For yeah, to just finally... 25 years <laughs> to get fixed. Yeah. I wonder how many developers were making games in 1993 for and thinking, yo, we're going to make so much money off this. <laughs> <laughs> Probably too many, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Well, what happened was a lot of the developers left, so they had third-party developers afterwards, yeah, like yeah. Neo and all these weird ones came in. <laughs> Well, let's talk about something else that um, caught my attention before we get into our interview about Task Set. Now, we did a, a whole month about adventure games. Yeah, yeah, recently. that was awesome. Love doing that and love adventure games, point and click games. Monkey Island's one of my favourite. I actually did a live stream on our uh, Facebook page. And one of my favourite movies is Back to the Future. Yeah. Imagine if someone could combine those two things. <laughs> well, somebody has. <laughs> now, this is Back to the Future Part 3, Timeline of Monkey Island. And this looks awesome. So what is this? So this is a adventure fan demo. So 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 somebody's made this for you specifically. Now nah, somebody's made this. <laughs> probably yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm probably the only person that will play. Now actually, this looks awesome. So essentially, what, what, I mean, it's a bit hard to find out exactly how they've done this. They haven't given many details, but mm. really, it looks like a Back to the Future point and click adventure game, kind of based on the Monkey Island engine. Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. So it's like. At first, at first glance, I wasn't sure if they'd just put sprites in, um, you know, and change like the uh, the dashboard, the yeah. you know, kind of thing at the bottom. Um, but yeah, if if you read it and look into it, it might be like you say, it could actually be more. It's just using the engine and the principle, of, you know, what that kind of game's about, and then they've actually made it into the story of Back to the Future Three. But why Back to the Future Three? What a four? <laughs> like, <laughs> not number, the first one. Yeah. Not the first one. <laughs> number three, like kind of thing. At least start with number one. Well, yeah. yeah. I'm just looking here, and it seems to be that they've got like extra features, like a hoverboard. Yeah, well, there's, yeah. there's, there's a little image of a hoverboard going yeah. over, you know, the the wooden bridge in Monkey Island. Yeah, so it seems like they use all the background graphics and the, the locations. Must on the be map. must be a kind of version of the Scum Engine or yeah. some some kind of modified thing. Essentially, it is the story of Back to the Future, but yeah. put into this world of Monkey Island, which it's it's a bit bizarre, but I think it's very cool. Yeah, no, I think that's a really cool. Love child, really. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like somebody's love of the game, somebody's love of the film. Uh, well, it's obviously the same guy, but yeah, no, that's really interesting. I think I think you should do a live stream. Yeah, <laughs> well, there is a, a one-level playable demo that you can yeah. download and play on your on your PC. Um, 
and someone's put here that apparently Lechuk is like the ancestor of the Tannen bloodline as well. <laughs> isn't it? So it's like, yeah, it, it is mad, but I think that's awesome. More stuff like that. I just, I just love it. When, oh yeah, we I, need like Jurassic Park and Day of the Tentacle or something like that mixed up. You know? <laughs> so if you're doing a download that, I mean, it's free to uh, get the one level demo. I'll put that in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Right, well, next week, we're going to be having a little look back at the best bits of 2018 on this show. And quite the year for retro, really, hasn't it, 2018? It's been crazy. You know, we've been picking clips for this show and some of the most amazing people that I've wanted to talk to, we've talked to this year. Some some absolute heroes and some of the subjects that we've covered are absolutely amazing, like first-person shooters, the introduction of multiplayer gaming, hacking, getting chased by the FBI. Just, oh, there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely join us for that next week. A little look back on some of our favourite moments of 2018 and then the week after... To look nervous, boys. The retro hour super quiz will be back for Christmas. We're going to do it, aren't we, Joe? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I like the enthusiasm. <laughs> right then, let's get into this week's special guest, all about Task Set with Andy Walker. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Andy Walker, the former managing director of Task Set. Welcome to the show, Andy. <laughs> That's a wonderful welcome. Thank you very much, Darren Red. Well, I mean, let's let's start your story, you know, all the way back from the start. I mean, do you remember when you first saw a computer or a video game when, when you initially experienced one? Yeah, yeah, certainly. That um, it uh, grew from uh, an arcade experience, but I loved the arcades. I grew up at the seaside in Bridlington, and I'm back there now. The arcade experience was pinball then. So when uh, much later uh, I was involved in electronics a lot, I could start to see uh, the very first microprocessors came wafting across my desk. And I thought I can do stuff with this. But everybody that I talked to about possibilities of video games or just having fun, really, they thought I was nuts. I was on another planet. So it was a very long time before I could actually make something work that was a proper video game. But, uh, yeah, computer games I started with as soon as I could compute. Well, you were working with the civil service as well, with computers. What was that like? It it was a very good job, and I'm extremely grateful to them for the experience. Uh, They were very good to us, uh, and we travelled the world and had a wonderful time. Uh, I suppose the first bits I was playing with were 4-bit, uh, later graduating to a whole 8-bit uh, processor, just a development board. So um, 8 LED, or 8 lamps, and 8 switches, and that was it. You were building your own machines then at first? Well, that that was the first development kit, uh, which I'd convinced the department to buy for me, uh, just to play with. Um, but the industrial-style computers that we were using... Um, at work were, there were things like um, a huge Ferranti with um, uh, hard bootstrappable and punch tape and things like that. They were very difficult to have fun with. But as soon as a microprocessor came along, I'd been playing with 7.4 Logic for years. And that allowed me to do things that looked like they were computing, uh, but with no uh, no real intelligence behind them. But as soon as I could program, then it was it changed the whole ball game changed, and that's I knew right there that's exactly what I wanted to do. Well, you mentioned obviously growing up in or living in Bridlington as, as you were at the time in Oregon. Now, I mean, for people outside the UK, the seaside towns were where the the arcade machines really thrived here in Britain back in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. I mean, was yeah. there, do you remember when the like um, digital arcade machines started coming through in like the the late seventies and early eighties? I mean, did you get much caught up in that scene? Yeah, that that absolutely did get me going. Uh, the arcades in Bridlington were good examples of arcades they're they're really top i think that the first uh space invader machines in europe were in bridlington for their claim to fame i think they were brought in by saddler automatics there was a queue to play that was the first thing that that was remarkable once they'd got a foothold though um they've been through the uh, the realms of galaxians uh following space invaders but it's still Far and away, the best video game that's ever been made is William's Defender. And it's it's an awesome piece of kit. I'm too old to play it now. 
it wipes the floor with me really, really easily. But it, it remains the best ever. Well, how did you start working with AWL Electronics? I was at the department. I wanted to play games, so I quit uh, to build computers. And I thought the next obvious thing to do was to get a factory and start to make machines. Uh, it didn't seem to be any more difficult than that. So, uh, so we did. I built the computers, uh, wrote the software, started to employ Gibber. That's where I first met Tony Gibson uh, and Andy Rickson, who joined as a carpentry apprentice, believe it or not, because we need we needed to make cabinets. Was that like a YTS scheme kind of thing? Then was it? Or... <laughs> <laughs> just about, just about. We had uh, we had no right to succeed whatsoever. It was all string and chewing gum, uh, but it worked. Well, you wrote the classic game, The Pit, which, you know, I've heard people say was actually the inspiration for Boulder Dash, because, you know, it came out about two years before that, didn't it? Yeah, we did. Um, and Dig Dug and all sorts of other things that were probably off the back of it. But that's fine. Um, I enjoyed The Pit. Uh, it was really hard work. Lots and lots of very late nights. That's just the way it was. Have you ever asked Peter Leeper about, you know, whether he was inspired by it? Of Boulder Dash? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, he said he was. All right. Uh, he's in print somewhere there as uh, the same sort of thing that I would say in the same position. That obviously he didn't copy it, but he may have been inspired by it. <laughs> That'll do. That's near enough for me. Boulder Dash is a great game. So, were you impressed when you first got a Commodore 64? Yeah. We were, uh, Paul and Mark had already joined uh, by then. Task set was up and had taken over all my interest, really, from AWL. And we were looking at VIC-20 as a target. Uh, obviously, I like 6502-style things. We were also looking at Auric that took over from the Tangerine stuff. Same people, really. But the Auric screen was just not usable. It <laughs> wasn't a video gamer's screen at all. But the VIC-20 looked like it had some legs. And we were just really getting stuck into that when you could hear these talks that there was a, a new 64 machine on, on the horizon somewhere. And as soon as it came to UK, I said, that's a, a real game changer. It didn't look anything like the Sinclair stuff, did it? it? It looked like the sort of thing that parents would buy their kids. Obviously, you can do homework on it, but it was a real gamer's PC. Yeah, you had the VIG yeah. chip in there and the SID chip as well. I mean, that yeah. was like a dream come true, was it? For Absolutely. Goes? You're absolutely right. It, it was fantastic because somebody obviously understood what needed to happen to make games. And they built it all into the chipset. It's fabulous. Did you look closely at the Spectrum as well then and ever consider making games for that? Yeah, I did once write some stuff for Spectrum. Uh, Z80 was a nice processor. Uh, it was you know, really capable and... There were techniques that um, we played with quite a lot of just um, pointing at the screen and popping everything that way uh, was the fastest way of pouring stuff onto the screen. Uh, really enjoyed uh, some of the, if you like, the shortcuts uh, in Spectrum because it was very raw, isn't it? There was, it was just like a gang of memory in a screen and, and a Z80 that was pretty capable. But there was no finesse around it. There was no no smart sounds, no... All sorts of things were missing. But if you just wanted something raw uh, and cheap, that was it. Why did the name change to Task Set? <laughs> it, was, um, uh, it was an off-the-shelf company. Uh, AW Electronics uh, with the factory and all of the arcade side of things was in big danger of losing money. Uh, I wanted to move to uh, home computing. Uh, it was... There wasn't one. There was no real industry, was there? It was all... Uh, the arcade stuff began to be dominated by people like Sega uh, and really smart chipset. And you started to need a, um, a studio if you were going to succeed in there. So uh, we'd set up just an off-the-shelf company. I think it was 30 quid or something. And the name came with it. That was it, task set. That'll do for me. Well, was it a goal to make your games up to the, the standards of the arcade titles? Oh, definitely, yes. Uh, we enjoyed writing for um, Coinop. Uh, it's still as hard um, as it is today, where I'm still writing games for the coin industry. Uh, but the playing public will vote with their, as it was, 10p then. And it's really harsh 
because if the cash box is no good, I don't care how much you like the game, it's crap and it's instant. Uh, you know when you launch the game, if it doesn't take money, it's usually because the game's no good. Jamming was an interesting concept, kind of reggae influence game, and uh, based around <laughs> the music. Where did the idea come from? Oh, that's pure Tony Gibson. He he spoke in rhythms that were Mermajuk. It was just completely Bob Marley uh, all the way through his mindset. It was a natural game. We talked about it a lot, uh, but it it was his uh, all the way through. Uh, Paul Hodgson did tons of the work on the sound, uh, and we'd done the underlying. It was almost an OS uh, that we wrote to run it, and uh, so good. Uh, lots of people involved, but it's Tony Gibson's game, and it sounds like Tony Gibson. It was such an interesting concept, though, because you know no one had ever seen anything like that before. Oh, you're right. Uh, it it was unique, and uh, yeah, stronger for it. It was a really good game. I even read that Commodore 64 music legend Rob Hubbard, apparently he realised the potential of the SID chip after playing jamming and hearing that kind of, you know, that, that bass line that kind of went through it. Oh, right, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I read that uh, in an interview with him. So. That's flattering again, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, don't get much bigger well, than that on the C64, do you? A compliment from right? a musician. Absolutely <laughs> not. No, no, it's definitely my night tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, another fantastic title was Super Pipeline. That kind of really showed off the C64 graphics and audio. Um, how did that idea come around? <laughs> It was, it was drawn from uh, a coin-op game that never made it. Super Pipeline 2 uh, was really Super Pipeline 3. Uh, the original, the screen aspect was the other way around because most of the coin-op world was um, a portrait rather than a landscape screen. Uh, water flowing through pipes and leaks and plumbers were drawn from that. Uh, and that game happened because of a leak just above uh, Tony Gibson's um, development PC. Oh, no way. PC it was. <laughs> uh, but in our little offices up on High Street in Bridlington there, a central heating pipe sprung a leak. Yeah, we're running around as my dad turned up in his plumbing kit to fix it. There, there's a game right there, and that's where it was born. <laughs> it's amazing how inspiration can come from the weirdest things, isn't it? Yeah, but... The ideas bag is really important. And um, looking back on it, there were other things in there which perhaps we could have made um, if we hadn't run out of business at the time. But there were some other ideas in the ideas bag. I'm sure we could have uh, got. Got to remember, though, that the industry was so young then that almost any idea was a new idea. Yeah. And uh, that, that allowed us. Uh, things like, oh, nobody's ever done a pipeline game before. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> the industry is only three years old. Who cares? Yeah. Well, speaking of original ideas, Bozo's Night Out was a, a <laughs> game none had ever seen before. I mean, were you kind of aiming at a more adult audience with that? It was kind of like, like a booze fueled night out. And I know it was called Wobble Juice, wasn't it? Not alcohol in the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It had to be Wobble Juice. Uh, again, Tony and I nearly fell out over that. Uh, a lot of Tony Gibson in Bozo's Night Out is much more his game than anybody else's. Uh, but the, the idea of progressive uh, progressive uh, inability to, to, to control the joystick anymore. Our answer phone message was, uh, hi, you're through to task set, but we've all got to know the pub. <laughs> so, um, it wasn't an alcohol-fueled business, uh, but we did enjoy a pint. Well, I mean, with that game as well, it was kind of uniquely British, I thought. I mean, you know, obviously that kind of, especially the sense of humour that was around at the time is stuff like Viz magazine and you had Spitting Image on TV and that. I mean, I guess, especially being a seaside town as well, it was kind of a bit of that postcard kind of humour as well, I guess. Yeah, that, that's it. Exactly. That, that was the postcard. That's the only way we could really get away with it. I suppose it's wildly incorrect now to show people having fun getting inebriated. Um, only mildly wrecked and encountering all sorts of characters that you may find on a seaside town street. It sounded like you'd done your research a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Necessary. Had to do it. But we also had to call it Wobble Juice, um, I reckoned. It was a different time. The market had just moved uh, from glory times when people would send us a postal order for money and we'd duplicate the tape, stick, 
stickers on it and send it back to them. And it had moved to high street retail. The postal order type uh, trading was just dying out really quickly. And if we didn't get on the shelves of Boots and Smiths, then we wouldn't sell a single tape. If Boots had decided you're not getting on the shelf with alcohol there and booze and beer, but it's wobble juice. So it's just funny enough to make it to the shelves and so it sold. Otherwise, nobody would have seen it. Well, how were you developing these games? Was it all kind of just done straight on the C64? Uh, no. No, we uh, we had proper development systems and cross-assemblers and things like that by then. Uh, we did uh, invest quite a lot in uh, things like Sage 4 development kit uh, and then ROM emulators, which would plug into the back of uh, the C64 so that we could mirror the whole of the... Uh, the memory range. It was a bit, I suppose we approached it a bit uh, from an electronics point of view rather than a computing background. Uh, that's where I'd come from. That's what I was comfy with. And so it was, um, it freed us to develop off the target platform, which is always going to be faster in the end. Well, I did watch a clip um, that's on YouTube, actually, of your old offices, probably circa about 1984. And it's got um, Richard Whiteley's introducing the clip on there. It was on calendar. (laughs) Um, If you haven't seen it, I'll send you the link over it. It's it's a good watch. And then there's actually, I mean, there is some, like, graphic tools making graphics on the Commodore 64, um, you know, kind of using a joystick. And, um, I mean, were the tools that you're using on the 64, were they made in-house or were you buying stuff in? Oh, it was all in-house. We did buy a tablet uh, to help Andy. Uh, Andy had uh, grown hugely in his uh, computing and graphic capability, especially characterization. He was just gifted in that way. Uh, But there weren't any tools. There was nothing that you could buy. Uh, It was well worthwhile investing. It was a big change from coloring in little tiny squared graph paper uh, of pixels to make characters onto actually trying them on a tablet and then going for some uh, sprite animation on there. You could suddenly bring the whole thing to life. Well, Andy Nutter also kind of mentions the effects of piracy and uh, how that was uh, affecting Tasset, but also the industry in general. Was it was it a huge problem? Uh, yes. Yeah, it was. Um, it was a shame. And it was all the way through uh, coin-op and home industry. But in the home industry, people would spend... And, and be really quite clever about ripping things off. But in the end, that's what they were doing. They weren't actually contributing a game. Uh, and in the coin-op world, it was widely known that some of the uh, Galaxian boards that were operating were actually based on photocopies, where people had bought a real board, taken all the components off it, photocopied it, the track layout, and made their own boards from that. No way. <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's crazy. It, uh, there was a lot uh, around North London at the time, that uh, you could get rip-off Galaxy bo- Galaxian boards uh, really cheap. Uh, but it, it was still a thing. Uh, rip-off went into the home market, and that was such a shame. Um, it really did kill some of the, if you like, the really small... I thought we were small developers, but there were some one-man bands, and they just went to the wall, and it was such a shame. I think on those systems, like, you know, the, the Commodore 64 and the Spectrum, it, it was just so easy for kids to do it at home, wasn't it, with a tape to yeah. copy? There was no protection or anything, really, was it? It was difficult. We licensed uh, Pavloda uh, for our later games. Uh, so it was a little harder to run without a little bootstrap uh, running. But looking back, it was trivial to rip it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, did being based in Bridlington bring something extra that, say, you know, being based in London wouldn't have to your games or the company? Um yeah, I think it did. I think it was uh, not just seaside, but I think there was definitely northern humour, possibly some Yorkshire humour in there as well. I thought they were uh, a generation different from uh, the Manchester, the oceans of this world, because they were small somehow. It was just us having a laugh. Um, yeah, we did quite well out of it, and I think it was quite a good apprenticeship, but it was a giggle. Usually, from start to finish, it was a giggle. And I guess the fact also that, like, you know, um, like the guys from Zap 64 couldn't just pop round the corner and come into the office meant they actually had to, you know, make a conscious <laughs> effort to come and visit you guys if they wanted to, for example. Do you know, that is still the case. Mm. Uh, we have some 
some visitors turning up tomorrow uh, to work. And we know that they've only come to see us because there's nobody else at the end of this road. It goes into the North Sea. And to try those fantastic Bridlington fish and chips as well. Oh, you've got to do that. <laughs> you've got to do it. They're on the plate. Well, they're actually on the paper for you any time you come. Well, Gyropod was a great game, and it kind of took shoot 'em ups into the 3D world. How did this idea develop? Oh, we were trying to do something uh, of a spinning motion with sprites to see if we could uh, change them on the fly. Uh, and beat the spot down the screen. Uh, It set off trying to uh, rebuild a sprite in real time just before the spot on the tube got there, because they were CRTs at that time. And the effect that seemed to be most difficult was to get something that actually rotated or spun from the bottom of the screen back up to the top. And yet uh, we could have more sprites on screen than the hardware would allow. Sounds more complex than it really is. It's it's, uh, it's just being efficient with the code. Uh, and out of that grew a little spinning arrangement that turned out to be quite difficult to control. Uh, so that appealed to us. Um, from there, we just added lots and lots of bullets. Well, that's the thing with task set games. I mean, I always found that you had very original ideas. I mean, was that something that you strive for and really prided yourself on? Uh, yes. Or we were naive, uh, whichever one you pick. What we should have done was uh, Son of Pipeline, um, Master Pipeline, Plumbing Pipeline. We should have just majored on on that character, Foreman Fred, and not gone off and done other experimental things. And I think we'd have made more money. The ideas bag kept saying, oh, what could we do if we did this? What if we, what if we generated something out of a binary sequence instead of actually drawing it? I mean, in a way, did it kind of feel risky doing original games then? Because, I mean, a lot of companies at the time were just churning out like a, another Pac-Man or another Space Invaders clone, weren't they? You're right. Um, they did. Um, but it didn't feel risky. It just, it's not really how, how we approached it. It was, um, what's fun? What are we doing? And getting to the deadline was still really quite important. So, although I always thought it was fun, Uh, I know that there were all sorts of other pressures uh, to try and get to the the mastering house on the day that we'd booked it, otherwise the whole thing falls. But the pressure to do the next game, we already knew, I think, what the next game was going to be before one had finished, before we were mastering it. So uh, the pressure wasn't there to make a commercial game, it was... This is going to be fun. Let's do that. Which must have been a, a nice way to live, though, not having to feel like you've got to, you know, sell out almost, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, until it, it all went tits up. Mm. Uh, that was a bit of a shame. Uh, I think if I'd been better at business, um, we'd have all made more money. But uh, that's not the way life works, is it? Well, Poster Paster was a, a very fondly remembered game. Uh, who came up with that one? <laughs> There's a lot of Paul Hodgson in that. Uh, Paul and Mark especially. When you said there was a video of the offices, there'd be two windows on the first floor overlooking the street. And one day, uh, the window cleaner turned up. So ladder just appeared at the window with a bloke with a wet leather just sorting the windows out. And it was just the way he just came from nowhere. He just appeared in front of us. And he was as shocked uh, to see us looking back at him. Uh, So there was definitely a game there. But there's a... Uh, there's a lot of Paul and Mark in Poster Paster, and I always thought that was the game that was probably the uh, the most underrated. Uh, it's actually much deeper than it appears to be, and uh, there's a lot going on in there. I thought that was um, that would have more legs than it really had. When you're looking today, that like forums and stuff, that does seem to be one that gets mentioned quite a lot by by the fans. Uh, there are some some little um, yeah some deeper quirks and. Going back to Blackpool, Paul Hodgson turned up with a um, an old style folder file full of stuff from Poster Pacer that I hadn't seen since those days. He kept it all, Eddie. That's cool. He, he kept loads and loads of it. Brilliant. Well, you know, we're talking about that uniquely British sense of humour as well. I mean, uh, Seaside Special that saw the player throwing seaweed at politicians. I mean, did you uh, <laughs> did you get any grief for that then? <laughs> loads. 
Uh, but um, again, that's a real Tony Gibson game. Uh, it's where his head was at the time. The schedule went out of the window, really, on Seaside Special. It was a much more political game than a game, if you know what I mean. It was taking us into other areas. And I know he wanted to do it, and I wasn't very keen. Uh, it turned out to be a better game than I feared, but it was ever so late, ever so, ever so late. That was a shame. Well, I heard that game had a bit of a kind of strain development process. I mean, were, were there a lot of disagreements happening? Around oh, yeah. Time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there were. There were, uh, they were commercial, and it eventually, um, yeah, we fell out badly about that. N- never about the code or what was fun. It's just, uh, when are we actually going to get what we need uh, to go to the mastering house with? And when you've cancelled them a few times, it starts to wear a bit thin. I did read as well, did he want like the proceeds to go to the Green Party or something as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, this is all uh, remarkable for something that I might mention later. Mm. But, um, but yeah, Tony wanted a, a specific amount to go to uh, Greenpeace uh, from the game. And I was extremely keen that whatever, I'm mean, sorry, everybody was on salaries except Tony who was on royalties. So whatever Tony earned, I don't mind how much he wanted to donate to Greenpeace out of that. But we still had rent rates, light, heat, power, salaries, and everything else to pay. So, yeah, uh, that was another source of disagreement. that We had a business to run. And, um, yeah, we had no game. (laughs) So it all got a bit fraught, which was a great shame. But, yeah, that finally... That finally drove us apart. Well, the follow-up to uh, Pipeline was uh, Super Pipeline 2. It, it seemed to be really well-received. How did you go away kind of uh, improving and following up from the original? Um, we wanted to refine what we could do. In the earliest days of Commodore 64, it was obviously a brilliant PC, a brilliant home uh, games engine. But we were still learning what we could do. And utilities are really important and just ways of doing things, ways of driving the interrupt, which is uh, more efficient. And the more efficient it is, the more stuff you can do with the sprites on screen. I think the, um, the underlying theme to all of the task set stuff had its roots in our coin-op world, that we wanted to put in things like high score tables and uh, just make it feel more like the arcade experience. But that got refined the more games that we did. It, um, they just got better. They got technically better. And usually when things happen faster and crisper, it means that you can control things. Uh, the response to the joystick is just better. That was as true then as it is today, that if you press a button on a casino slot machine, if you don't get an instant reaction, it's a rotten game. And the more control you can give to people, the more likely they are to like it. And I think you could tell that with test set games as well. It was always, they had that very much, you know, just one more go kind of yeah. appeal about them. You'd always be like, oh, I'll, I'll just have one more try of it before, yeah. you know, three hours have gone by. Yeah, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm so glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that started with right back at the pit. Uh, there'd be times that uh, Tony and I were still playing that at one and two in the morning when we could really have knocked off about nine or ten at night. Yeah, the night's just run away with you. <laughs> yeah, it's just gone. Um, that, I think that's going to be true for everybody who does code. Well, finding out about, you know, those kind of last games that Tasset published, I mean, um, it's actually online. There's, it's a bit hard to tr- kind of track what, what your final releases were. I mean, there was a Flintstones game as well. Was that yeah. something that you, you put out? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, we were um, losing money and taking on contracts, uh, pretty much the same way as we did in the coin-op world, that um, sooner or later, uh, you have to earn real money. And if somebody comes along and waves a checkbook under under your nose, then, yeah, you'll do Dragon's Lair on Spectrum or something. You know, <laughs> What does it take to uh, keep the wolf from the door? Because that was Hanna-Barbera, wasn't it, Flintstones? Yes, yeah. yes, it was, but they'd been contracted by somebody else. I forget who it was, uh, but he contracted. He just popped up one day and said, um, 
we need this, we, there may be a follow-up, uh, we'll pay you X D thousands of pounds, can we have it before November? Okay, that's that done. And I guess around that time as well, I mean, you, know, you talk about how quickly the industry developed over those few years, you know, from the early to mid-80s. And licensed games were becoming a thing, I guess, you know, companies were looking at it as kind of another form of merchandise and they realised that this is what, we, you know, the kids are into. You're right. You're right. That's, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the industry changed and um, really large companies were spending really large amounts of money. And their initial entries didn't seem to do any good. And gradually they took over the independent studios or, or people from them at least. And they bought in the expertise they needed because you're right, they were marketing their label um, and their label had a game called this at the moment. So they weren't really marketing the this game. It was the label underneath it, just bolstering the, the logo all the time. Didn't like that time. Well, why did Task Set come to an end? Um, yeah, fundamentally, I wasn't any good at business. Uh, I like writing. I still do. I don't really understand profit and loss and balance sheets and things like that. My eyes glaze over really quickly. Uh, but I should have known more about business than I did. Um, we'd, I wrote what I wanted and we released the games that we wanted to release rather than the ones that we should have done. In a way, you left a great legacy, though, because, I mean, like you said, everyone was just kind of <laughs> learning as, as they went along, though, weren't they? It was like you were making it up as you went along. Well, we were. Honestly, there, there was no yardstick. Uh, there was no precedent. Nobody had really ever done it before, which is why I say we were so lucky that if we did a game about uh, putting posters up on a billboard, nobody had done that before, so it was heralded as unique, but it was just an a good idea out of the ideas bag. Uh, they were all unique. What did you do after tax set? <laughs> um, yeah, head in hands for a while and then did contract software. Uh, did work for uh, a number of companies, really. Um, uh, and then came across the boys from Rare again, uh, the Stampers. And that led us into Nintendo, so I wrote for Nintendo for a while. Digger T Rock, I think, was probably the best seller for that. Enjoyed that. Yet, yet another digging game. But uh, yeah, it, it's necessary sooner or later to go and get a proper job. So I uh, went to work for the fruit machine industry. Well, last month at Play Expo in Blackpool, I mean, it was great to see you, Paul Hodgson, Mark Buttery, Andy Rigston, all back together again um, for Play Expo. Yeah. I mean, what was that like, having, having the boys back together again? Fabulous. It was really good. Uh, it's lump in the throat stuff is what it is. It's, uh, I know that I'm one of the world's luckiest people uh, in all sorts of ways. But to have worked in such a fun time with a group of people who we all thought the same way about the games. This is what we wanted to do. And then the demise, the late, uh, the late Tony Gibson. There are so many guys who are uh, I knew at the time that are just not with us anymore. Mm. And then to meet up in Blackpool like that, it was just brilliant. And Blackpool itself was just brilliant. Meet up with a yak again there, uh, another pint with a yak, and Defender. I could play as much Defender as I wanted. What all, a great place. All free to play as well, aren't they, there? Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely lovely. Does it kind of blow your mind a little bit how much interest is still there in the old days? Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And... Mark Buttery still can't. He was last in on that in, on that talk, wasn't he? He was a bit late to the do. Yeah. Uh, and before the do, uh, he said, I don't know, will anybody come? Is anybody bothered? Because uh, we both know Paul Drury, and I've talked with Paul quite often. Uh, uh, he was the first one, I think, to convince me that there was more than just my grandchildren, who were quite interested in what went on some years ago. Um, it's still a bit alien, uh, very flattering, but um, yeah, yeah. Those The days have now gone. Uh, they won't come back. So um, I was glad to be there at the time. I think we made the most of it. I think the interest is just, it does seem to be 
a lot more now. I mean, my mum the other day, she, she texted me when she was in town. She goes, you know, they're selling um, little Commodore 64 minis in HMV now. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Blimey. But isn't it good that Commodore was recognised as the item? That's the item that people should have. Uh, it's as true now as it, as it was then. It was the game changer and made it all possible, really. What are you up to these days, then, Andy? What would you do? Um, I still write for the casino world. Uh, I like to keep my hand in. I love still getting into Assembler. Not very keen. I'm trying to learn HTML5, and I just hate it. Uh, I hate most browser-driven stuff. It's... Uh, hmm. I consider that C is much too high-level a language for me. You want to bang that metal? Uh, absolutely. If you're not <laughs> wiggling the pins on the chips, you're not trying. <laughs> I like um, it. <laughs> there's still plenty of uh, plenty of that to be done in the um, in the casino world. So I enjoy that. But uh, it's still a good game is a good game. I still picked up awards for it as well. Won best casino uh, game at the Dublin show, which was, yeah, very nice. That was a Dracula game. Uh, so it still happens, and it still happens in machine code. The reason I mentioned that it's strange how things circle back is that I'm now much more political than I used to be. Right. Um, uh, so that's my thing now. I shall stand for election. I think it's time that politics had some logic because it certainly hasn't got any at the moment. Might be time for Seaside Special too. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we should do. I turn up at fracking sites and things like that. Not been arrested yet, but I don't need to be arrested to make an, make an objection. Just can't believe what's happening, so it's, uh, it's time to bang that drum as well. Well, Andy, it's been amazing getting your stories. I mean, it's uh, you know, I, I watch your panel at Play Expo, and I, if anyone wants to find out a bit more, and you and the guys, the videos on YouTube as well. So I'll put that in the show notes at the oh, really? yeah. So well, uh, yeah, I'll put that link up there. If people want to watch it, but it's been so nice to have you on, Andy. Thank you so much for joining us. Dan, you just make it easy. I enjoyed yourself. Thank you very, very much.